So uh, apparently an impromptu plan has just happened. Uh, and, and we're saying, you know, if you caroled with us when we did our Christmas caroling, or if you wish you had caroled with us, we're going to sing We Wish You a Merry Christmas now for our prelude. Uh, so if you, if you want to stand and sing with us, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas and end with from First Baptist Church because that's what we did. So here we go. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good tidings we bring to you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas from First Baptist Church. Nice prelude, everybody. Okay. Praise team, assemble. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled by the number of people who are here this morning on Christmas. Uh, good job and uh, <coughs> welcome. And of course, we are celebrating Jesus' birth today, that he's come uh, in human form, taken on, a, on our flesh, you know, as part of the uh, redemption plan for us. So we're going to get started with Born in Bethlehem. Uh, would you please stand and sing with me? Born in a stable, humble Savior's birth. You left your throne in heaven above to live here on the earth. Baby Jesus lying in a manger, crying for the world. The angels told the shepherds of the good news for us all. Do you know you'll die for all our sins? Don't be afraid. standing for one more and you know for anybody who's like these are these are um, advent songs kind of early christmas songs i apologize we wanted to sing them because we hadn't sung them yet but <laughs> um anyway here we go
Merry Christmas. Welcome on this Christmas morning to our, our worship service. I just wanted to say a blessing on the people who have been plowing like crazy the last couple days and that we're even able to be out here as a testimony to their really Herculean effort keeping the roads open. Um, we don't have much going on as far as announcements. The church office will be closed this week. So... If you call, no one will answer. Expect that. Um, and New Year's Day, so next week, we will have church. We will not have Sunday school. We will also not have children's church, so similar to this week. Um, an announcement about the poinsettias. If you are responsible for any of the poinsettias, please feel free to take them with you. The, the coverings are underneath the table of cards out in the hallway to help it survive a little bit longer. Um, no one's going to be here watering them this week, so they will die. So um, if you have one, if you've purchased one or several and you'd like to take them, by all means, please do take them home and enjoy them. Yeah, you've got a couple days off, maybe. Great time for reading. Um, otherwise, I think that's all by way of announcements. Let's go ahead and take a couple minutes to greet one another this Christmas morning as we continue on with our worship.
Could you please rise? And we're going to sing Joy to the World. I don't know what number it is, but it's on the screen. invocation let us pray this morning lord god we take up the chorus sung by the angels so long ago in the night sky over bethlehem glory to god in the highest and on earth peace goodwill to men on whom his favor rests we are here today hoping in that peace which jesus christ brought into this world we are here today hoping in the glory which comes to you through jesus christ in this world we are here today to join in the worship, the praise, and the celebration that in Jesus, born in the manger, God became God with us. May we grow further and deeper in living a life shaped by the deep truths of the advent of Jesus Christ the King. Amen.
Okay, so we'll do a little difference. We're making the kids stay in here today. I'm going to do a, a short children's message. So you kids back there especially, pay attention. <laughs> I won't make you come up here because we've got poinsettias and candles and other things. But, oh, I guess they're coming. And then for the rest of you, okay, so imagine you're sitting in class. Okay, and the teacher's not there yet. Okay, so you're sitting in class, teacher's not there, so you're probably talking with your friends, maybe someone's throwing something, you, know, you get up, walk around, just having a grand old time. I, if you were like me, I did a lot of reading at these times, but I do remember some good games of paper football, and you know, you're just spending some time doing whatever. Okay, well, what happens when the teacher comes in the door? Well, if you're a, uh, a semi-well-behaved or well-behaved class, something happens. Otherwise, you know, if it's a poorly behaved class, they just continue on. Um, but if you're a semi-well-behaved <laughs> class, suddenly the noise stops. The paper airplanes aren't being thrown anymore. The people who are wandering around the room go and sit down, and everyone gets ready for the day. <coughs> gets ready, get, you know, get your pencil out, and get ready to do some stuff. So why do we stop and pay attention when the teacher shows up? Well, well, because it's, it's school time, and the teacher there, the teacher's the important person, and now it's time to do school. So, the important person we pay attention, who knows why we celebrate Christmas? What do we celebrate? What do we celebrate at Christmas time? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, good. We celebrate that Jesus was born. Was Jesus an important person? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right, good. Jesus was an important person. But you know what's really interesting? When we, when we read about Jesus' birth, not very many treated him like he was an important person. It's kind of like the teacher walking in the classroom and everyone keeps throwing stuff, playing around, doing whatever they're doing. Don't pay attention at all to the teacher who just came in. Jesus came in, but people didn't stop. There weren't parties to celebrate him. People just continued doing their normal life. So at Christmas time, we celebrate that Jesus was born. We celebrate Jesus coming into the world as a king, but we recognize that a lot of people don't know that Jesus is an important person who came then or today, that Jesus is the king. And you know what? If we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times I think we're more interested in the cool stuff we got under the tree than in remembering that Jesus is king, is an important person who should make some things happen in our lives. So what I want you to try today, both for little kids and for, for grown-ups and everywhere in between, um, and for little kids, maybe you can ask your mom and dad to help you. Think about what happens if Jesus the King shows up? And, and maybe what are some things you can do that show you understand that Jesus the King showing up is an important person? Maybe what are some things that you can do to bless other people or a special way you can stop and pray today? Just as a way to remember and show that Jesus is an important person who showed up and who continues to show up in our lives today. All right. Good job, guys. You can go back and color now. <laughs> okay, the first scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, which can be found on the, in the Pew Bibles, page 1072. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. 
He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, everlasting and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The Offertory Prayer. Let us pray. On this Christmas morning, we remember the wise men who traveled from afar bearing gifts to Jesus. They came with gifts to worship one who in some way they believed and understood to be a special king. We too come today with gifts, and we pray, Lord, that you would accept these gifts as a token of worship, as a symbol of the desire of our hearts to receive you as king, as savior, as friend. Bless these gifts which are given to use them to grow the kingdom of the king we worship, King Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. And the second scripture reading is Mark chapter 1, verse 1, which can be found on page 1551 of the Pew Bibles. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. There is a famous ancient Greek inscription, famous as far as ancient Greek inscriptions go, which is famous in a very small section of the population who's kind of weird. But allow me to geek out for a minute and introduce you to this inscription found in the city, in ancient Greek city, Priena, which is now in modern day Western Turkey. So they found this inscription, and it's a big, long inscription, but in part it says this. For the birthday of the God was the beginning of the good tidings for the world that came by reason of him. That's part of this inscription. And that I'm sharing it now, Christmas morning at a a church service, may make you think that it's an inscription about the birthday of a God, the Son of God, Jesus. And that's actually not what the inscription is. The inscription ascribes good news to the entire world at the birthday of the God. And it refers to the man that we know as Augustus Caesar. Also Octavian, the name may ring a bell. Who was born in uh, roughly 63 BC, somewhere around there, September 23rd, 63 BC actually, as best as we can tell. But the inscription was carved into a stone in 9 BC, which is a couple years before Jesus was born. And it's celebrating Augustus Caesar, the good news of his birth. And this word good news is incidentally what we translate as gospel in the Bible. The same word. The Roman official responsible for setting up this inscription, he was the governor of Asia at the time, a certain Paulus Thaddeus Maximus. He calls the birth of Augustus Caesar the beginning of the good news for the world or what we might translate as the beginning of the gospel for the world. In addition to this gospel, this good news being a word used to herald the birth of Caesar, um, several familiar Christmas story words pop up in important ways around the ancient world that Jesus was born into. For example, the title Lord in addition to being the way that that the divine name Yahweh is translated in in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it was also a title used for the master of the Roman world, that is Caesar. Caesar you would call Lord. Or when the angel shows up and tells the shepherds, unto you this day in a city of David is born a savior, this word savior, again, in the the Greco-Roman world, was ascribed to Caesar. Caesar was the one who saved the Greco-Roman world from famines and from war and who brought peace. So when Matthew and Luke 
record for us these birth stories about Jesus, they're telling us more than just the basic facts about what happened. They're telling us in ways that help us to see how Jesus' coming into the world is an upending challenge to the powers that be in the world. So we're not citizens of ancient Rome, which is probably a good thing. Um, and these associations, these meanings of the words, we have to learn them. But, but one point comes really straightforward when you start to read these narratives with a little knowledge of these words. Jesus is a challenger to Rome. But not in the sense that he sent out to conquer Rome. In fact, he very explicitly puts that dream of many of his followers aside later in his life. Because really, conquering Rome is far too small of a thing for what Jesus set out to do, far too modest of a goal. Jesus is a challenger of Rome and any other human kingdom which sets itself up as the bringer of life and death, the, the one that brings provision, the one that controls the world. In short, any human kingdom or endeavor that sets itself up as God, as the ruler. So these, these words, gospel, Lord, Savior, these familiar words to us, that, that crop up in our birth narratives of Jesus. Let's, let me read a, a familiar passage from the Gospel of Luke, and we'll think about it for just a couple minutes together. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we read, In those days, Caesar Augustus, right? so this Caesar who was heralded as the God that brought good tidings to the whole world in the Roman world. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. So here we have the, the familiar stuff of the Christmas story. We have a heavily pregnant Mary traveling with her husband-to-be Joseph to Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a small village, really, then. It still is a small city today. Um, and David's descendants, who would be going back to the city of Bethlehem, there was a lot of them. So Joseph was likely planning on staying with some relatives there. They show up, and the place is packed. The guest rooms and all the houses are taken. No one has any room for them. And they end up staying somewhere where animals are usually kept. But being ready to give birth, perhaps, Mary and Joseph were a little relieved that they have an out-of-the-way place, out of the hustle and bustle of all the family members running around, choking the streets. But there, in a barn-like thing with the animals, um, and probably with a, the local midwife at hand, Jesus is born. That's the Christmas story that we're used to. And, and you can throw in the shepherds and throw in the wise men. You've got the whole, whole scenario, everything going on. But the language that Luke uses when he tells us about this happening, this birth of Jesus, it invites us to see something deep and significant in the birth of Jesus, that, that Jesus comes and he is heralded with the greetings and the titles of emperors and kings. Jesus is pointed to by the angels as the Lord, as the Savior. And how can it be that this 
Jewish baby born to a single mother in a little out of the way hamlet of Bethlehem in, in Palestine, how could it be that he who had no power or prestige or pedigree, how could he be heralded as emperor, as savior of the world? The beginning of the Gospel of Luke shows us many ways that Jesus is the one who's going to pick up the threads of promise from the Old Testament that have been lying there for hundreds of years, dormant, or that God's people have been waiting to see fulfilled. But it also shows us in significant ways that God's work to tie up these promises, these hopes of the Old Testament, that it's going to be bigger than, more consequential than, and slightly different than the narrow and nationalistic hopes that a lot of the people in Israel had at the time, that, that Jesus comes not just as a local king, a local ruler, that God through Jesus intends to lead people into peace, that God through Jesus intends not just to rescue the little nation of Israel, but to challenge the rulers of the world. That Jesus comes to bring a peace that no emperor could bring. That Jesus comes to be a savior from a crisis that is greater than the emperor can deliver anyone from. That he comes to be Lord and savior over all. That he comes to be true God over all. In, in Luke, in this short birth narrative, the short story of, of the, the birth of Jesus, we're led to consider just who this Jesus really is. We're forced, really, to consider what the advent of Jesus means for us. Because it certainly means something for each one of us because Jesus comes to be king, emperor, ruler, savior of the world. And we're all in this world. So what does this advent mean? Jesus comes to be Messiah. Messiah is, is a title. So Jesus Christ, Christ is a title. It's just the English word for the Greek word, for the Hebrew word, which we also have an English word Messiah for. Okay, so it's six one way, half a dozen the other. Messiah and Christ is the same thing. Jesus comes as Messiah. He comes to challenge Caesar and Rome. He comes to challenge the nationalistic hopes of many of the followers of God at the time. Jesus comes to bring hope and to bring riches to the nations rather than to come and conquer and subdue them like Caesar and Rome had done. And at times, I think we can fall into the trap of assuming that God's plan and intention in Jesus is no bigger than our own lives or maybe our little slice of history that we're living in. So when we look at things this way, Jesus always ends up being cast as the solution to my problems right now or to the problems of our age, that Jesus came to fix these problems. And of course, there's some validity in that because Jesus is God's solution to the problems of life, of this age as well. But what we see here at the beginning of Luke, many other places and many other ways in our scripture is that Jesus came to do something much bigger than just fix the problems that I have that you have, that we associate as important ones today. So maybe, maybe I don't like my boss today. Well, Jesus came not only to make me feel better and learn how to help and be nice to other people, but Jesus came to sever the root of strife between people. Or maybe I'm sick and eager to be healed. Well, Jesus didn't come just to make me feel better. He came to banish sickness and death from the world. 
or maybe my life is full of grief and hardship. Well, Jesus came not just to give me a hallmark life. Jesus came to undo the brokenness and futility of life in this world. And that, I think, is perhaps one of the great purposes of Advent for us year after year. To be confronted with the rescue that God sent. To hear spoken over us the claims of the ruler, just what kind of rule he has come to establish in this world. To have our hope, faith, joy, and peace shaped not by our own best thoughts or ideas of what those should be, but shaped by God's intentions, which he lays out for us in this Jesus whom he sent, this Messiah who comes to us. Because without this Messiah, we would have our four candles in our Advent wreath, but no central one. Without this Messiah, people would still have hope. People would still have faith and live by it. People would still have a pursuit of peace and of joy. But without the fifth candle, the promise or the hope of Advent is empty. It's an unachievable reality to live in hope and faith and joy and peace. Because what we see in Advent as we reach the end, really technically yesterday is the end of Advent, but we're kind of extending it one extra day this year. What we see in Advent is that hope, that faith, that peace, that joy, they are all Messiah-shaped. They all center on and are held together in Jesus the Christ. And the good news of Advent is really, in the final estimation, the birthday of the God is the beginning of the good tidings for the world that came by reason of him. This inscription scrawled in honor of Caesar Augustus on a rock in a city of, in Turkey really speaks true words about Jesus, the God who was born to be God with us. So it's not Caesar not any president or king or congress or business, financial institution, therapist, friend, family, co-worker, but Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, born to rule the world with peace, justice, and grace, who is the beginning of the good tidings for all the world. And this Jesus is born to rule your heart. So on this last day of of our Advent commemoration, I ask you to consider today, what will you do with this King who has showed up? What will you do with Jesus? Will you pray with me? God, thank you for King Jesus who you've sent into this world to rescue. Thank you that you have sent him to bring hope, faith, joy, peace like never before. And we pray, Lord, that we would recognize day by day the King who has come and that our lives would be shaped by the hope he holds out, the faith, the the joy, the peace. Lord, that our lives would be shaped towards you and become more and more Jesus Christ shaped. Bless us, Lord, as as we finish shortly our our worship today and and go about the time that we have, Lord, in this celebration of Christmas, and may we remember that Jesus came, and it is in his name that we pray, amen.
So we come now to a time of prayer in our service. If anyone has any requests they would like to make the body aware of, now is the time for that. We lived in Kentucky for several years, and it's one of the, you know, it's the, like the funny, it snows, and everyone freaks out, but, but really most people in the South don't have the stuff, the clothes for going outside in the cold, and Thanks for sharing that. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, there is something awe-inspiring and terribly beautiful in a winter storm. And it's much nicer when we have warm houses and warm clothes and we have big plow trucks that are able to keep the roads open and clean. And, and it's not a, th- a threat to most people that we know. Oh God, we do thank you for the many who have been working hard at, at plowing, keeping the roads open. And we do remember especially the many, Lord, in our community and especially around the country for whom this storm has been a threat to life and livelihood. And we pray that, Lord, there would be mercy and there would be provision where provision is needed. And God, we do pray for a return to normal winter, especially for, Lord, those further south who, who don't have houses and things prepared for this kind of weather. God, we pray for the Christmas break, and Lord, for, for many of us, Christmas break brings a lot of joyous opportunities to be together, but we also recognize that there are our kids for whom Christmas break is a hard thing hard in in many ways and where school is the the safest and best part of their life and we pray for God we pray for your goodness your mercy we pray that um, we would have eyes open hearts open to be able to help kids and families that we know of who need help and God, that you would be merciful in this break to those who are in need of it. God, we do also just thank you that in the midst of 
all of the struggle that, um, that has come to Trevor with the uh, identity and other things being stolen, Lord, for this, this special event, Lord, of being able to be married. And, and Lord, how, how blessed that is that in the midst of the wreckage, something beautiful can come. And we pray that it will be a beautiful life as they learn how to live together in, in marriage. And God, we do just remember the travelers and, and pray for those who are trying to get places and who are stuck places, Lord, that there would be safety in, in the traveling over the rest of this holiday season. And Lord, thank you for the time that we can gather together and remember that Jesus the King has come. Lord, fill our hearts with the joy of that today. We pray in your name. Amen. As we go now from this place, here is benediction, the words of the angels. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men on whom his favor rests. Amen. <laughs>